this goes back a long way. There's seven boys and seven girls in my granddad's family. And uh, Uncle, uh, Uncle Joe was the oldest, and then Uncle Jim. I'm speaking strictly of the boys. Now. I'm not putting the girls in because they, they back that long ago, they, uh, they, uh, the women were uh, uh, child raisers, and that was about and housekeepers, and that was the extent of their uh, uh, contribution to society, if that's a proper term. So there was Joe and Jim, and then Ike. Ike, he got interested in the gold rush, the 49ers. He was about uh, 14 years older than what my grandfather was. My grandfather was born in 49, and it wasn't unusual in large families like that for kids 14, 15 years old to start out on their own. In fact, I, I left home when I was 14, and I never returned home myself. Ike, he wanted to go west. It took a little money to get there, but money those days was when you are working for 10 cents a day, it didn't take too much money to amount to a lot. So the boys all chipped in, and when they handed up, why Ike left uh, Don Mills for California with $200. Whatever he came up with was divided according to the contribution at each one. If you put in $20 and I put in 10 why well, you'd get a bigger slice of the pie than what I did. When he got to California, by the time he got there, the gold rush was over. But he was so taken up with the climate and the land and the picturesqueness of the whole thing around there that he acquired ten and three-quarter acres. Roseville, which is just outside of Sacramento. He acquired that and, uh, and uh, worked it and made a at least a living on to it, and planted and and uh, and uh, walnuts and uh, almonds and uh, all the different uh, uh, nuts that are grown there. And then he had uh, uh, so much was in uh, in grapes. So he had a, a vineyard there. And in other words, everything that was uh, considered a farm, they called it a farm or ranch. Now I'm not sure which they called it. And he uh, just had a little shack on there, you know, and and he finally got lonesome to come home. And about uh, uh, 15 years after he's out there, well, he got money enough together to make a trip home. And when he came home, he had enough money to pay the boys off. And, and what he did, he just... Uh, doubled their money, and which made them very happy. If you put in 20 and got 40, that was great, see. He also then picked up a wife to go back with him. That was uh, Aunt, Annie, uh, Aunt Annie Blackburn. She was a young girl at that time. In fact, she was 30 years younger than he was. And she was only a young girl. And they went to, and he, she went back to California with him. Well, as they worked and prospered over the years there, they finally built a real nice white cottage there, and they had their drying bends and onions. They grew a lot of onions there, too. And these big Spanish onions, California onions, or Spanish onions. After he died, he, he died in 1924, and she uh, sold a uh, property there then. She sold the 10 acres off that they had acquired for $1,500, and she sold it for $50,000. She kept the, retained the three-quarter acres with the house and the dry pens onto it as a place for her to, to live or wherever she wanted to go back to California. So she came home at that time, and then the Depression hit. When the Depression hit in 1930, 31 in there, they, uh, the people that had bought the property for the 50000 couldn't keep the payments up onto it, and her, uh, her um, oh, what would you call him, her collector, her attorney, notified her that, uh, that she better come back to 
California and make some other arrangements there because they, uh, the people had moved off and left the property and then it would be claimed for taxes if she didn't get out and do something about it. So that's when uh, when we took her to California in 1934. We made the trip to take her to California, which we did. And, and uh, I never saw her again after that. But uh, she, uh, she wanted to go. She didn't want to fly. She didn't want to go by railroad because she'd made seven trips across the country and back, and she'd never seen it all because the trains were at night. and. Uh, they were, uh, you missed the biggest part, and she wanted to see it all because she didn't expect she'd ever make the trip again. And uh, so she uh, made a deal with me. She'd make the down payment on the car and buy the car to make the trip with. And of course, after you bought the car, you'd end up to make the payments for 30 days. And at the end of the 30 days, I could do whatever I wished to do, keep the car, let it go back to the dealer for, uh, uh, what do you call it, on a, on a uh, replevin deal and let it go back that way, or I could keep it and make the payments on do as I like. She paid for it. And uh, plus a hundred dollars, but she gave me a hundred dollars to for my time to take her back, and she bought the gas and oil and meals and everything on the way out. And then this hundred dollars was to bring me home. And uh, so that worked out real fine. But in the meantime, my dad's first cousin, Norris Crafts, he had gone west and had uh, gone through to California to visit Aunt Annie about that time. And like I say, she was 30 years younger than, than, what, than what Uncle Ike was when he died. And she was about the same age as, uh, as my dad and, and Norris Crafts. So what happened, nobody knows. This is pure conjecture. But anyway, when Norris left California, he had quite a bit of money with him. He had enough money that when he came back to Omaha, he, uh, he acquired the property where the city hall of Omaha, where the, where the uh, city hall and the county building and so forth in Omaha there, he acquired, had enough money to acquire that property, which was vacant at that time. And it was only a short time after he acquired that, that, uh, that the city decided it would be a great place to, so they, they gave him a considerable sum for that piece of property, and along with that, they bought him an equal size of property on the outskirts of the town. And he hung on to that, and it wasn't long until the town caught up to him and was surrounding him, and he, and he, and he made another bundle off of that. And uh, when he cashed in on that, why, at that time, the uh, uh, United States government was uh, paying 4% interest. The banks were only paying 3%, but the uh, United States government was paying 4%. So he, uh, he put the proceeds of the sale into bonds coupon bonds. We clipped a coupon every so often. And he left it there and let it grow. Well, by the time that uh, that he, when he made the trip home, I was being 1950, in 1953, and he visited us at that time with an old valise. And you know what a valise is? One slips inside the other and strapped together. And he put the valise in the living room. I wanted to put it away, and no, he wandered right by his feet all the time. And uh, he nursed that valise the whole afternoon that he was here. 
which we thought was a little bit odd. And uh, when it come time to take him to the to the depot, he was going through to Buffalo, New York. And if he boarded a Greyhound, and since his ticket called for Buffalo, New York, he wouldn't have to go through customs. At, in Canada, he could go right straight through. Whatever he had here, was he wasn't stopping in Canada. He was just passing through. So he, uh, he opened up the valise to show me what he had into it. And we counted $142,000 worth of bonds and uh, stuff that he had in there. And uh, what, uh, what uh, prompted him to show it to me before he left, I don't know. But, but uh, he showed me what he had in there before I took him down to the, to the depot. So we got down on Grand River about it. Uh, Oh, I'd gone to Warren and was going down Grand, right down Grand River to the bus depot. We got down on Grand River just at the police station there at 12th Street, and he said, hey, do you mind stopping here for a little while? I said, no. So I stopped, and he pulled out his watch, and he said, no, I don't want to hang around the depot down there. And he said, it's about 15 minutes from here downtown. I said, yeah. And he said, well, I'm going to go to sleep. And he said, you wake me up and give me his watch. And he said, you wake me up at whatever time it was. And I did, so I went down. When I went down, he got right out of the car, and the bus was there, and he got right on the car so that he didn't have to to uh, uh, take a chance on somebody swiping his valise or something before he got there. Well, he went through to New York with that, and he had his sister in New York who was married to a... Methodist minister with the name of Aldi. I had never met the man, never met Aldi, but uh, he had told me that that's where he was going to to Aldi's. And apparently, when he went through there, he left quite a bit of money in a safety deposit box or someplace, and I'm not sure that they've ever found a jet or what he did with it, because he had a, approximately a hundred thousand dollars when he got back to Omaha. And after he died, that's what they discovered was uh, around a hundred thousand. But what happened to the forty-two thousand that he had here when he left? I haven't any idea, and neither has Aldi. In his will, he stipulated that if Aldi would change his name to Crafts, that he would get the bulk of the estate. Now he left every Crafts that he knew of anywhere from five hundred to a thousand dollars. That is every adult crap. And uh, my brothers and, uh, and my dad and cousins, anyone that had a name by the name of Crafts got a thousand dollars and the rest of it was left to Aldi if he would change his name to Crafts. And if he and he had to have a son, he had to have an heir. And name the son Crafts too. If Aldi wouldn't uh, change his name if uh, Reverend Alder wouldn't change his name to Crafts. He, uh, his estate was to be split right down the middle between between your dad and uh, and your uncle John, because we were the only two that had had boys. The rest of them all had girls. Every one of them had girls. My my dad was the only one that that had boys. At that time, Ben didn't have a boy either. Ronald, you see, it, uh, I, I, he might have had, uh, Ben might have had a boy at that time, but if he hadn't, the Norris didn't know about it. Because when he visited there, why well, Ben didn't have any boys, Delbert didn't have any boys, and your dad and I, or your dad and your granddad, your granddad and I had a boy, you see. So he left each one of us a thousand dollars, and he left uh, your granddad and I a thousand dollars, and he also left your dad and uh, and Uncle John a thousand dollars. He went right up until eleven days before the year was up. He had to he had one year to make his decision and to go through the necessary uh, papers, you know, that that uh, took to change his name, and he had to had to. Uh, 
changed his name and changed the name of all of his heirs, the Crafts. Eleven days before uh, before your dad and Uncle John began to figure they were going to split them at about forty thousand dollars a piece. I mean, going to split eighty thousand with about forty thousand dollars a piece. Eleven days before that way, Aldi decided to change his name, uh, and at that time, my son-in-law, who was an attorney, and uh, he was ready to bet that that he would never change his name, that he was a man of the cloth, and he'd never change his name for the dollar, but uh, he did. And then I found out through a neighbor of mine who was assigned, was transferred from here to Buffalo, Snyder is a, is a suburb of New York, a wealthy suburb of New York. And this was the church that, to the parish that he was preaching at. This neighbor of mine, he and his wife went to church several times to hear him, and they said he was a remarkable speaker and a very had a very engaging personality. And uh, his church was packed. They had found out that when he changed his name to Crafts, he gave 10 percent. Uh, in other words, they call it tithing. He gave 10 percent of his inheritance to the church right off the top and then paid the inheritance tax on top of that again. But how Norris came by his money in the first place, that's a conjecture, you know, whether he and Aunt Annie were more than friends or not, you see. That, uh, he had some way anyway of persuading her to loan him enough money to get started. And so this this money that, that he left, the crafts especially, my dad and, and we boys, why well, we felt that really maybe in the long run, that was a way of, of him knowing that the Crafts boys had started Uncle Ike out there in the first place. And uh, the nearer, I think the nearer you, uh, that you see the uh, handwriting on the wall that you're not going to live forever, that the less, uh, the less value you put on material things and you think more of Wearing things up as far as you can. This is 50% uh, of what I've heard, and, uh, and I'm partly splicing it together and, uh, on my own visualization. So there's no, there's no way that you can point a finger at something you don't know. You have to give everyone the benefit of the doubt, and, uh, and you're innocent until you're proven guilty. So. <laughs> What, what were the other speculations about how Norris came by the money? What was the well, he may have he may have promised to marry Aunt Annie or, or anything like that, you know, and, uh, because he was a he never got married until after Aunt Annie died, and then he uh, he was only married for about a year, and he wrote us and told us he was getting a divorce that she wasn't good enough for the crafts, and, and he wrote a book on the crafts. Uncle John's got the the whole book that he. Oh, and it's a full-size book. He can take you right back to where they, where the crafts first came over in 1796, and uh, and it was a crafts who uh, who was instrumental in uh, in writing Yankee Doodle Dandy. You know that Yankee Doodle Dandy went to town upon a load of switches, and all this type of thing, and uh, and it seems that each generation there's been a a crafts that was able to uh, to put his thoughts in uh, uh, into some uh, form of rhythm or poetry or whatever you want to call it, and uh, uh, seems to be one in each generation that has been able to do that ever since they first came over. And I don't know whether you've ever been down east enough to pick up a phone book, but I have never been down there. But they tell me that in around Boston, that uh, uh, that used to be Roxborough before it was Boston, uh, that you pick up a phone book there and that crafts are as, as popular as uh, Smith's or Jones's are in Detroit. And that's where we originally landed. 